Good morning. I can definitely say amen. Looking forward to that day when there will be no more snow in heaven. There's a gospel song that says every day will be Sunday over there, so I think every season will be summer over there as well. So. And all you winter loving folks, I don't know what will happen to you. <laughs> I know it's going to be warm. Right? Um, just a quick disclaimer I have my cell phone in my pocket, and I have it on vibrate because my wife is very pregnant and it could pretty much be any day now. So. Uh, just in case it starts buzzing, I'm just going to check and see if it's from her. If it's from her, I might answer, and then perhaps you will have to finish this sermon. <laughs> <laughs> I should have told you what I was preaching on before. <laughs> or it'll just be a quick wrap, wrap up. <laughs> so, uh, I was glad to see some of you all yesterday uh, at our fundraising cabin Estic, and we had a fun time. We had maybe 70 people or something like that were out. And uh, we were able to raise uh, $2,000, uh, so praise the Lord for that. And uh, the, the big project this year that we're looking to finish, Lord willing, is a uh, multi-purpose uh, tower, climbing wall, repelling wall structure. Uh, that also will be a zip line uh, go from one end of the camp to the other end. It's a 45-foot uh, high uh, tower, so uh, the poles for the structure are already installed, and Lord willing, uh, in the month of May, We'll be able to finish the project. Uh, so I said last night that we needed five thousand still, so minus the two thousand, we still just need around three thousand dollars, and we'll be able to complete that. So thank you all for your prayers and support for the uh, ministry at camp over the years. Um, our our heart's desire, and uh, sharing with you last night, our, what our what our goal is has always been is to uh, introduce young people to Jesus Christ, uh, they, that they can come to a saving knowledge of Him. And this past year has been really great. Uh, two years ago, so not past fall, but the fall before that, we started um, a year-round uh, fall for discipleship ministry uh, with youth from the area that had come out to camp during the summer. Um, and with that, we wanted to, to, to grow spiritually and to learn more. And, uh, and there's no, in the Lachute area, there's no church youth group or anything like that. So, um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of opportunity. So we started that two falls ago uh, with a, we had an intern that was here for the year, and then this past fall with a uh, staff member that uh, his title was Follow-Up and Discipleship <coughs> Coordinator. We've been doing that every Friday night as well, and he meets with young people as well throughout the week to ask questions. And it's been really, really encouraging. We have around 50, 15 young people that come out every every Friday, and um, a lot of them, so a lot of them would have come to camp, and then a lot of them, as well, and some of them as well, have been invited by people uh, that, that have been coming, friends from school and things like that. And the focus this year has been on um, really um, being disciples that make disciples. So not just, uh, you know, oh, I'm a Christian, and I go to church on Sunday, or I go to youth group, but okay, what can I actively be, be doing to share the gospel with my friends and things like that? And, um, and so we've been looking at a different apologetical things as well, um, how to, what's the case for Christ or the case even for God, how can we look just in the world around us and know that there's a God that exists and things like that. So it's been really neat. La uh, the month of January, uh, so we have two months ago, we had a baptism service with three young people that, uh, that were ready to make that commitment uh, of following Christ. Um, maybe one was 13, other was uh, 15 and 16. So uh, yeah, just, just wonderful to see what God is doing and um, seeing more of the same. So this summer we have a, a full summer planned, six weeks of day camp, four weeks of, uh, or five weeks of overnight camps. So um, we trust that the Lord will uh, be at work. And uh, if any of you all know young people that are looking for uh, somewhere to go for a week during the summer, be sure to be there. <laughs> I know you already do. So, and if anybody, uh, uh, older people like to help out, there's always a wide variety of ways uh, that you can uh, help out during the summer. So uh, just come and talk to me. And I'd be glad to see any of you all, I think. <laughs> uh, this morning, we'll be looking in the book of First Corinthians. First Corinthians. 
Kings chapter 10. We're looking at verses 1 through uh, verse 13. So I'll read it, and we'll pray, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll start to unpack it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. All right, so moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual food, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. And it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day 23,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. For there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Three things we're going to look at this morning. A warning, uh, four examples, and then an encouragement. So a warning, uh, four examples, and then uh, an encouragement uh, from these verses right here. So let's just pray and we'll uh, continue to hear God's word. Lord, I thank you for your word that you've given to us. Um, thank you that it was written for our encouragement, for our instruction. Uh, Lord, you gave it to us so that we can be strengthened in you, uh, so that we can uh, grow up and be established in you, Lord, uh, as mature believers, Lord, in the faith. And I just pray, Lord, that we can take to heart everything that you want to show us this morning, Lord, that we can apply it to our lives, um, Lord, that we can be changed, transformed by your word, Lord. Father, God, make us more like your son. I ask this morning, Lord, that you give us all ears to hear uh, what your spirit is saying to the church. Uh, Lord, that you would remove, um, Lord, every uh, distraction, Lord, and everything that would um, that would keep us from truly uh, hearing and understanding your word. Lord, we ask that your spirit would be fully present among us uh, and that yeah, your power would, again, Lord, transform our lives for your glory alone. So Paul is writing here in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and actually at our church in Lachute, uh, the French church, we're going through a series uh, on 1 Corinthians. And um, in the past, in the chapters 8 and chapter 9, Paul talks a lot about Christian liberty. Um, because there was this question in the Corinthian church, um, can I eat food that has been sacrificed to idols? That was, was a custom of the day they had, um, they had um Food that was sold in the marketplace but before they sold it, um, they would sack, they would uh, offer it to the idol or bless them the name of the idol or whatever, and then after that it would be sold to people to eat um, as food because we know the idols can't eat the food, so people have to eat them. So, um, so the question though among Christians, though, and there's a good question to ask, oh, I'm a follower of Christ, okay, can I eat this food that though has been dedicated, been sacrificed um, to an idol? And Paul kind of goes, he, he gives a theological explanation. He says, you know, okay, well, when we look at it, you know, um, when we look at the facts and look at it the, you know, theologically, you know, an idol is nothing. There's only one God uh, that exists. Everything else uh, is just so-called gods, but there's, they're not real. Um, there's only one God. There's only one Lord, and we know that to be, to be true, to be fact. So uh, they, they think they're offering this into idol, but these idols, they don't, they don't really exist. They're nothing, he says. But at the same time, Paul says, um, there is something real that exists, and that's your, uh, the people around you, your brothers and your sisters that are seeing what's going on. And even if we know in our heads, he said, that, um, that uh, 
that, you know, in your head that, okay, an idol is nothing. There is only one God, there's one Lord. And when I eat my food, I'm giving thanks to God for it. I'm blessing in the name of the Lord. It says, you might know that to be factual. You might know that to be true. But the person next to you might not know that. And they might be offended. And they might might be a stumbling block for them. Or, or, or different things like that. And so he's saying, Paul is basically, so chapter 8 and 9, he's saying, okay, we are able to do a lot of things as believers. We have a lot of knowledge. We know things. Um, but he says, knowledge puffs up, but love is what edifies and what builds up the body. So he says, sometimes and many times, we need to set aside our liberty. We need to not just look at what I'm able to do, what I can do. I can do this, I can do that. But look at what, okay, what should I do? What is going to edify? What is going to build up? What's going to be encouragement to those around us? In chapter 9, he gives an example from his own experience. Paul says, I could have drawn a salary as a as a preacher, as a missionary, I could have been supported by the church. I could have received. That was my right as, as a worker among you. I would have had the right to receive money from you. But Paul says, I willingly set aside that liberty so as not to be a stumbling block to, to you all and to other people that would say, oh, you're in it for the money. You're doing it for the money. So Paul gives an example from his own life. He says, I'm doing the same thing myself. And then at the end of chapter 10, he says, so I set aside this liberty for others because I don't want... Um, other people to, to be to be, to be a stumbling block for them. But he also says, at the end he says, for myself too, I have to be careful with what I'm doing in my 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 Christian life because I don't want to to be, a, I don't want something in my life to become a stumbling block for myself. I don't want, after all the ministry, everything I've done for the Lord, he says, I don't want to be uh, a castaway or rejected or fall off, uh, go off the, off the, off the straight and narrow way because of the way he's living his life. So yes, I have to be, be concerned about others, but I have to be concerned about myself as well. And I think I'm strong, I think I'm able, I think I can do this and that, and there's nothing in the Bible that says I can't. But Paul says, I'm going to make sure, though, I'm going to make sure that after everything I've done, he says, um, just like an athlete uh, in the Olympics, we just finished uh, the Olympics, right? Um, I know Canadian, Canada did good, and you all got a lot of medals. Um, see, I'm an American. So I'm just happy that our women's hockey team, the you all sport hockey team. <laughs> but, you know, everybody uh, going into the Olympics for the past four years, the past eight years, or however long they had been, um, they had been, you know, undergoing this discipline where every morning, every day, every week, you know, they're focused on this, not because it's against the law for them to, you know, eat at McDonald's every day or whatever it might be. Um, but because they're trying to discipline their body, they're trying to bring it under control um, because they have a goal, they have a purpose. And Paul says, I have a goal and I have a purpose as well, so I'm bringing my body under control. And so then in chapter 10, what we're going to look at this morning, Paul uh, is talking to the Corinthians and he, he says, okay, I'm going to give you an example. I've already given an example from my life. I'm going to look at the Israelites here. Uh, we're going to look at an example from history um, because it's important that we realize this thing that it's not just because right now, uh, I'm doing good in my walk with the Lord, I'm standing strong, I'm persevering, and everything like that. That's no guarantee that tomorrow, or in a month, or in a year's time, things are going to be the same way. Paul said, if, if this is the Apostle Paul that had seen the Lord Jesus, that has preached to, to thousands and thousands of people, people get saved, people get healed, people get raised from the dead, he's an Apostle, wonderful ministry, and Paul says, myself, he says, I'm not taking anything for granted. I'm not taking any chance. I'm keeping my body under discipline. I'm watching. I'm being careful what I'm doing because I don't want at the end, he says in verse 27 of chapter 9, I don't want to be, after I've preached to others on myself, I don't want to be a castaway. So he gives the example of uh, the Israelites, the people of Israel. So we, we know the story a bit maybe. Um, God calls a man named Abraham um, who was in uh, around the land, what we call Iraq, Nowadays, God calls him and says, uh, leave your country, leave your family, go to somewhere else, I'm going to show you. Abraham believes God, Abraham follows God, and God leads him to a uh, land called Canaan. And God, God gives him promises. I'm going to give you, Abraham was 80 years old, he couldn't have, or 90 years old, couldn't have any children, but God said, I'm going to give you children, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, you all are going to have this land, it's going to be your inheritance. And so... Um, so this is, that's where the, the children of Israel come from, or the, the Israelites, um, and, or even the Jewish people as we know them today. 
And so, though they were in Egypt for a time, they had to leave uh, the land of Canaan because of a famine. And God says, okay, you can go to Egypt, but I'm going to bring you back there. And you know the story um, that Egyptians started mistreating them, uh, and God sends plagues, uh, ten plagues, um, that are just uh, terrible c c um, catastrophes for the Egyptians. But God miraculously spares the Israelites the whole time. Finally, God brings them out. Um, and then so Paul starts talking about this experience they had where God has just done amazing and wonderful things for them. So he says, Brother, I don't want you to be ignorant how that all of our fathers, so he's talking about the ancestors of, of the Jewish people, because there's the Corinthian church had Jewish people and Gentiles, so he's speaking specifically about the Jewish people, their ancestors. He says, they were all under the cloud, they all passed through the sea. So right when God brought them out of Israel, out of Egypt, excuse me, um, God put his, his presence in a, in, uh, in a cloud that went before them. The cloud went before them in the daytime, and, and fire went before them at night. And that was how God led them, how God um, guided them in the path that they were going to follow from Egypt to um, to the land, back to the land of Israel. And that cloud protected them as well. When the Egyptians were coming to chase them, God hid them with the cloud. So he says, they all were under this cloud, they all passed through the sea. So here he's talking about the Red Sea that they went through. God miraculously knows the story opens up the, the Red Sea. They pass through, and after that, when the Egyptians try to pass through the Red Sea, God brings the water down on top of them. So they were all baptized into Moses, he says, in the cloud and in the sea. So not talking about the baptism of the they but just the, the experience, being immersed in this experience with Moses that God was using as their leader to bring them from the land of Egypt to the land of Israel. And then so he says after that verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual meat or the same spiritual food. So God gives them uh, food from heaven, literally food from heaven called manna. Um, it was God's provision for them every day. Uh, it came down and said, you just have to gather what you need for today. You don't have to worry about tomorrow or the week. Just gather what you need today. And every day God faithfully brought them that manna. And then when they complained, they complained God also sent them quails and meat to eat as well. Uh, and then after that, verse 4, they'd all drink the same spiritual drink. God, uh, by his miraculous power, gave them water to drink. Once the water was bitter, he, they, uh, God says, throw this palm tree into it, and the water became sweet water. Another time, uh, there was no water. The people were complaining again, uh, and God tells Moses, hit, hit this rock. And Moses hits the rock, and water comes gushing out of the rock. And, and so God's providing water for the people as well. And he calls it the spiritual, the spiritual drink that was provided by God. An interesting little tidbit of Jewish tradition here. The Jews had a tradition that, um, and whether it's true or not, we don't know necessarily. It's not written in scripture, but that the rock that Moses hit um, and the water came out of it, that the rock followed them through the desert uh, for a certain period of time. Paul kind of makes allusions to that. It says they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. But he says, uh, most importantly, it wasn't just a, a physical rock, whether that tradition is true or not, but he says that rock was Christ. So the presence of Christ and the provision of Christ with them. So they had all these wonderful things, all these ways that God manifested and showed his presence, showed his power. Um, and they had all experienced these things. It's not just things they had read about, things they had heard, um, things somebody had told them. These are things that they experienced themselves. And you say, well, they must be good to go, right? Because if all this stuff happened to me, well, I would be good to go for the rest of my life. I wouldn't need uh, anything else. But... Here's where Paul gives the warning in verse 5. Because the trip from Egypt to Israel is supposed to take um, uh, maybe, maybe a couple of weeks. It's, not, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a distance, uh, but it's, it's not that long of a distance. Uh, they didn't have cars and planes, but you know it, it's doable. They, the traders and the caravans did all the time take a couple weeks or whatever. It didn't take them a couple of weeks, or it took them 40 years. Verse 5 says, but with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. What happened? What happened? Paul gives this warning. God says, God was not pleased with many of them. And a whole generation of them had to perish, had to die in the desert because God was not pleased with them um, because of the unbelief in their heart and because of, and because of the things that we're going to look at later. They had just been set free. They had just been given liberty by God, set free from, from slavery, from the Egyptians. But this new liberty that they had, unfortunately... Um, they did not discipline themselves the way they should. They didn't have the right mindset. They didn't keep the faith that they needed to. And so God was not pleased with them. And so a trip that should have taken a couple weeks ends up taking 40 years. And a whole generation of them had to perish in the desert. 
So Paul gives a warning, says, uh, these things were, were written for our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And Psalm, uh, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 106, verse 14, it's a psalm that kind of uh, talks, talks essentially about their, about their trip through the desert and, and everything that happened. And he kind of sums up with his word, says, they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. Well, verse 13, they soon forgot his works, they waited not for his counsel, they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. So just this experience, it should have been a, a wonderful time uh, in the presence of God as this brings them in this new liberty from Egypt to Canaan. Instead, they're forgetting what God did for them. They're not waiting for his counsel. They're just wanting anything and everything, not being content, and they're tempting God in the desert, he says. And Paul says, God gave these, God recorded these things though as examples for us. God, God let us see these things that happen to them so that we can so that we can be encouraged to it, so we can take heart through it, and so we can be warned through it. And let's look at these specific examples. He mentions four of them uh, from verse 7 to verse 10. First he says, Neither be idolaters as some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. The first thing he says, do not commit idolatry. So the story he's talking about right here is from Exodus chapter 32. You can read it when you get home this afternoon. Um, what happens, Moses goes up on the Mount Sinai, and God is giving him the Ten Commandments. And Moses tells the people, you know, separate, uh, consecrate yourself to God. Uh, you can't even touch the mountain up because the presence of God is here. But I'm going to go up and meet with God, and I'm going to come back. So they're supposed to be waiting for him. So they wait for a certain amount of time, but after that, um, they start getting impatient, right? And uh, instead of praying or asking God what are, what's supposed to happen, what are we going to do? They just get overly impatient. They say, we don't know what's happened to Moses. Um, he's gone up on this mountain to meet with to meet with some supposed invisible God that, that we can't see. This isn't, this isn't working for us anymore. We need a different kind of God. We need a God that we can see, uh, something that we can relate to more on our level, um, something that's more compatible you know, with what we, we saw in Egypt, in Egypt they had, their gods they could see. We need something the same. So they go to Aaron, uh, who was the second in command, and Aaron says, okay, bring me all your gold items, um, and I'm, we're going to make um, we're going to make an idol. We're going to make we're going to we're going to make a god. And and the, the thing about this is not it's not like they were saying um, it's not like they were saying the god that brought us out of Egypt that's one god and we're going to go follow another god. What they did though is they make this golden calf and say this is the god that brought us out of Egypt. So they're saying okay the person that did all this uh, the thing that did all this well, we're going to say that it's we're going to say that it's this golden calf right here. And an idolatry, it, it, it's, it's stupid at, at, in, 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 one, in one point of view, but at the same time, it's something that we all fall into the trap of, that we all get kind of sucked into, and we don't, I, I don't think any of us here worship statues or worship idols or things like that, but it happens any time in our lives where we substitute what we know about God and the true God that we know with anything else. Uh, in our lives, anything else in our experience that we want, that we can relate to better, that we can trip, that we can trust more, that we can, that we can, that we can actually see. So it could be money. Paul says, uh, greed, covetousness is the same as idolatry. And God has provided for me a hundred times in the past, but for whatever reason, now I'm getting at the end of the month, and um, there's bills I have to pay, and I don't have the money to do it, and so. Um, or I just, I just want more money for whatever reason or whatever it might be. So instead of trusting my God is going to provide for my needs as he has been faithful in the past, he's going to be faithful in the future, I'm trusting more uh, in, the, in the, what it says in my bank account. And if, if I have a lot of zeros after uh, the, the one, I'm going to be, I'm happy and I'm, I'm, everything is good. And if there's you know, not a lot of zeros, well, oh no, I'm nervous, now I'm worrying, and if I only had a little bit more, then I, then I would be, then, you know, everything would be fine, and I'd be content. And that, that's idolatry, because the sense of, 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 of just peace that should come from God, we're getting it from money instead. It doesn't have to be money, it could be relationships as well. A person in your life that if, when this person, uh, when they're the way they should be, or when, when uh, and everything, um, then, then your life is fine, then everything is good. But if, as soon as that person, as soon as things aren't right, then, then your whole, obviously things are going to affect us, but when we're 
just not able to have any peace at all, we're anxious, we're stressed, we're worried, or whatever it might be. There's all kinds of things that become idols in our lives, and it's easy to point fingers at the issue. Why would they make a golden calf? But look at our lives. Is there any area of our life where we have um, subs replaced God? Um, we've, we've, we know what God has done. We, we know we can't deny what he's done for us in the past, but we're replacing him with something else, something that we can relate to more. Or even when we corrupt the image of God and, and instead of holding to all the truth that we see in Scripture about who God is, but we kind of want, we want to minimize it. Like, well, God is just love, and we don't want to talk about how God is also a righteous judge, and God uh, will judge sinners on the last day, and that God uh, God hates sin. And we, we don't want to talk about those things because it doesn't fit with our cultural view of, of what God should be like. So we, we that's, that's a form of idolatry as well. Anytime we're changing what the truth about God is and we're changing it to something else, that's idolatry. So Paul says, do not commit adultery as uh, idolatry as they did. Uh, and there, there was a, a, a judgment that came on the people after this, and there was many of them that ended up dying um, in a plague that God sent on the people because of the idolatry um, that they committed. After that, though, Paul says not just idolatry. After that, verse 8, he talks about uh, sexual immorality. He says, some of them they committed and they fell in one day 23,000. And the story he's referring to here is from Numbers chapter 25. And you can look at that when you get home. So in Numbers chapter 22, 23, and 24, um, there's this man, his name is um, Balaam, and he is, I don't, we can, I don't quite know how to explain it, but he's, he's kind of like a prophet and, and a seer uh, at the same time, and he had communication with God, but he wasn't part of God's people, um, and he wasn't necessarily, he wasn't a, a, a good guy, per se, but he did have communication with God, and God spoke to him, and anyway, there's a king named Balaam who didn't like the Israelites at all. And he wanted to destroy them. So he says, I'm going to call this prophet, Seer guy, Balaam, and I'm going to ask him to curse the people of Israel um, so that so I don't even have to go fight them. Uh, and he's going to curse them and they're going to die or whatever. But so Balaam, and, and he told Balaam, I'm going to give you a lot of money if, if you do this for me. And Balaam's, you know, sure, whatever, I'll go do it. But God, but God, told him, God tells him no. And they come back and say, I'll give you more money. And so he goes ask God again, and, and God says, all right, you can go. Um, I'm going to let you go, but I'm not going to let you curse him. And, and so, and Balaam keeps trying, can taste in different places, curse, curse God's people, but he, but he can't. He's just, God is stopping Balaam. He's not allowing him to curse God's people. It stops. That's Numbers 22, 23, 24. What happens in chapter 25, though. Balaam um, comes up with a different plan. Uh, and God does not let his people get cursed by Balaam. But... Balaam goes to uh, the, the Moabites, that was the, the, the people of the king of Balak, and he, he introduces the, the, the young lady and the, and the young ladies and the young men from the Moabites to the people of Israel, and he brings them into contact with each other, and there's sexual immorality that starts taking place, and, and, and the whole people is starting to get, get, starting to get corrupted by this. And sexual immorality, it's one of those sins, and really all sin it is... It's, it's like cancer, and it doesn't just stay in one small, tiny corner of your life. It, it grows, it expands, it multiplies, and it, it, and eventually it affects every area of your life, everything in your life. And you can't just say, okay, it's just going to stay over there. No, it's going gonna, it's gonna to consume everything. It's going to consume everything and destroy your lives even. It's what happened with, with the children of Israel. They, they started this, this, these relationships. And then they started worshiping their gods and, and doing their sacrifices and following their idols and everything like that. And the whole people was just being were being corrupted by um, because of this one that started with this one sin. And what Balaam was unable to do uh, through cursing uh, the people because God didn't allow him them the people through their own uh, through their own uh, love, the lust of their heart and through their own weakness uh, with regard to this area of sin um, they were just able to. They just end up destroying themselves, and there is 23,000 of the people that uh, died through, no, through another plague that God sent um, to the people um, and that were killed as a result of this, this sin uh, that they tolerated in life, that they allowed in their life. And we can't play with sin. We can't say, uh, nobody's going to know, or, or I'll deal with it later. If there's sin in our lives, 
if there's if there's sexual sin, sexual immorality in our lives, we have to deal with it. We have to cut it off at the root. Because he says right here, destroyed it destroyed the people of Israel. Not not completely destroyed, but twenty three thousand of them they ended up dying uh, as a result of this. And Paul in uh, in First Corinthians has already talked about it in chapter six, um, in chapter seven. Um, saying, you know, you belong to Christ. Your bodies are the temple of Christ. You can't then, if, you're, if your body belongs to Christ, you can't allow your body to become uh, united and one in sexual immorality with somebody else. Because you belong to Christ. You're holy. You're set apart for Him. So we talk, he's already talked about this before, but he's just reminded, he's given that reminder. Be careful. Look what happened to the Israelites because they allowed this sin in their lives. Verse 9, then he talks about, he gives another example. He says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Uh, the story that he's talking, talking about right here, and, and really what is tempting Christ, is when, um, when we've already seen what God has done for us, but we're not going to trust and believe him unless we see something else. Unless, we, unless, unless he, he does something else for us. You know the story with when Jesus is in the in the desert being tempted by Satan, and Satan is tempting Christ to tempt the Father. He says, "Throw yourself down off of the off this high point, uh, just to, to see and to make sure that God is going to save you and that God is going to protect you, because it's written in Scripture the angels are going to bury you up." But Jesus says, "No, it's written. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test." We don't need to test God to make sure that God is going. God is faithful. We don't have to to make sure He is. We know it already. We've seen it and. And that's what faith is. That's what faith believing. We've seen what God has done, and we're able, we're ready to believe, we're willing to trust, even if even if everything isn't the way we want it to be right now. The people of Israel, though, uh, they they were they, they didn't have water. And you think, okay, well, they already had um, God had already given them water miraculously a couple times, so they should know that God is not going to let them starve, uh, um, uh, die from uh, from thirst in the desert. But no, uh, they start complaining again. They start complaining. Um, because they don't have water. And, and Moses, why did you bring us out here? We should have stayed in Egypt, um, where at least we had plenty of water there. Uh, and they're tempting God. And God sends, uh, this time as a consequence, he sends uh, snakes, serpents among them, and, and the snakes start, start biting people, and there's people that are getting, uh, they're getting this, this poison in them, and there's people that start dying. But even in that consequence that God sent, uh, God allows provision. Um, so they don't all perish. And God tells Moses, make a brass snake. Put it on a pole. And the people that look at that brass snake on, on the pole, he says, they're, they're going to be cured. And they're going to be they're gonna be healed. I mean, that's a prefiguration of Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus says, the same way that the snake was lifted up in the desert, I'm going to be lifted up on the cross. And those that look to me, even though you've sinned, even though you've, you've done wrong, and, and you deserve the consequence, if you look to me, I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to cleanse you. And so, um, Paul though, warns and says, don't tempt Christ the same way they tempted Christ in the desert, and they were destroyed of serpents. Finally, verse 10, he gives the fourth example. He says, do not murmur, complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed of the destroyer. So, here's something about complaining again, but in a different context. Uh, murmuring. And this is this, uh, in Numbers chapter 16, a uh, story about three men named uh, Korah, Datham, and Abiram. And um, it's an interesting story because um, these three men go up to Moses and they say, uh, Moses, you know, uh, why are you always making yourself out to be somebody special? Um, why are you always taking authority over the people of God? He says, they say, We're, aren't we all holy? Aren't we all set apart to God? And, and it's true because God had already God had said to them, you're, you're going to be a holy you're going to be a holy people for me. You're going to be um, a royal priesthood. You're going to be all of y'all are set apart for me. But what was the problem with uh, these three men, Korah, Nathan, and Abiram, and there was two hundred people that that followed them, was that they were not willing to accept the leadership that God had put among the people of Israel. And God didn't. God could have set up a democracy where they elected a leader, um, and they had the leader had. Elections every four years, and after that it could be somebody else or whatever, but that's not how God chose to do it. God chose to set up one leader, Moses, and after that Aaron, and there was people that helped them. There was other judges and things like that, and there was other leaders, but it all came to this uh, to this one uh, 
person of authority that God had put among them. And they did not want to accept that. They didn't want to accept the structure that God had put in the church. Uh, not in the church, excuse me, in the, in the, in the congregation in the, in the, among, their, among the people of Israel. So they start complaining. And they say, who are you, basically? And so Moses says to them, okay, here's what. Because Moses, Moses, Moses isn't going to argue with them and say, well, this and well, that. Moses says, okay, we're, we're going to see. If you all just die regular deaths, grow old and die regular deaths, if you can read this number, chapter 16, well, that means uh, that, that, okay, y'all are right, and I'm just, I'm just nobody, and, and I'm not really the leader God has set up. But if you all, if you all don't die regular deaths, but the earth, <coughs> and it never heard before happens, the earth opens up and swallows you all alive, then you're going to know that I am the leader that God has set up among his people. And so uh, Moses tells the people, get away from these men. Stand, step back, stand away, because something is going to happen. And so the, some people step away and some people stay there. The earth opens up, though, and swallows these men and those that were following them, swallows them alive. Now, and then it's really interesting what happens after this, um, because the next day, you would have thought, okay, after this, Moses has respect among those people. Everybody's going to respect him now. Everybody's going to realize, okay, this really is God's man. But no, there's still this discontentment this, that's going among the people. Um, and, and they start complaining and they start murmuring again. This time they're saying, okay, well, Moses, that's not right. You just, uh, you just destroyed uh, all 200 of God's people. That wasn't right. You shouldn't have done that. And you would have thought, you know, they would have realized, no, that there's this, when there's a seed of discontent, and it can spread, and, it's, and it happens in churches today, uh, still uh, this a seed of discontent and not willingness to accept uh, the authority structures that God has put into place um, and, and, and turns into rebellion. And, and, and oftentimes you think, oh, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. I'm just talking about it with other people. But that's just as bad, and that's what happened here. They were murmuring. They were talking about it amongst themselves and complaining about it. And, and next thing you know, um, there's, a, there's another plague that happens among the people, um, and there's uh, around 20,000 of them um, that die from that plague uh, that, that happens there. And if Moses and Aaron hadn't intervened, there would have been more of them that died, but they come and they plead before God and they intercede, God, please uh, don't destroy all of your people. So, so this, this complaining and this murmuring that he's talking about here... Um, and we're not supposed to complain about anything, and we, we have a tendency it's easy to complain about the weather and to complain about to complain about uh, all, all, whatever you know, whatever it might be in life. But specifically, he's talking right here. This complaining in the context of the authority that God has set up. We're not we're not content, and when we're uh, that we're not we're not doing anything wrong necessarily. But there's this, just this feeling, this attitude that's going wrong with people and not accepting uh, the the leadership that God has set up. And so Paul says, uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Look at what happened to the children of Israel. Look what happened to so many thousands of them when, uh, when they were complaining and they were murmuring. And he, so he says in verse 11, all these things, these, they happened to them for, to be in, as, as examples for us. And God allowed them to record it to be examples for us. And we can think, oh, it's just this little sin or it's just this, that, or, or, or we're not even realize how serious it is, but Paul says, and he tells how many people died, and, and these aren't pretty stories, these aren't fun stories. Um, but he says, these things happen to them to be examples for us, admonition to us upon whom the ends of the world are come. And so finally then, uh, this he sums up saying, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. So look at yourselves. Look at yourself. Examine yourself. Examine yourself, and and if you think you're you're you're, do, you're doing well in your faith and you're strong in the Lord, then praise the Lord. And I'm I'm glad I'm glad that you're maturing Christ, that you're standing fast in Christ. But He still says, take heed, be careful, pay attention, lest you fall. And He gives the just the final encouragement in verse uh, thirteen, because and you say, okay, well, Paul, uh, if Paul wasn't even sure that he was going to make it, and if the Israelites, all, all these wonderful things happened to them, but then so many of them ended up dying. Well, then who am I? How can I be? Uh, how can I be sure that I'm going to be able to persevere to the end and that I'm not going to fall by the wayside of so many of them? And then that's why he gives the big encouragement in verse 13. He says, "There's no no temptation 
has overtaken you, but such as is common for man. So first of all, he says, the temptations that you're going to undergo in your life, um, they're not temptations for, for angels or for superheroes that only people with special powers can resist. He says, no, there's things that are common to all of mankind, to all of mankind. And he says, and God, who is faithful, will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able. So then he talk, brings back to God and says, God is faithful. God is never going to allow you to undergo temptation um, that, that, that's, that's beyond what you're able to bear. God is never going to bring you into the situation where, uh, where it's just, well, the devil made me do it and I couldn't resist. No, God is faithful. God, wants, God, God has every interest and wants you to, to stay on the straight and narrow and wants to keep you. And so he says, with every temptation, God is also going to make a way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. So the third thing he's saying here is when you're in that situation of temptation and you only see the temptation and you only see this thing that, that you know is wrong but you're desiring to do and, and this conflict that's going around in your mind, he says, well, look around because God is at the same time, God has a way of escape. And, all, and, you, and, you, and, and, and the enemy is here, he's tempting you and you're looking this way, but he says, look around. God at the same time, he's there, he has a way of escape somewhere. And this is just God proving himself to be faithful again and again. Whatever the situation might be, whatever... Whatever the temptation might be, whatever the conflict that you might be in, and maybe you're at a point in your life where just seen, you're just ready to, to give up uh, because of the trials you're facing, because of the, 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 the hardship that you're going through, the suffering that you're going through, or whatever it might be, and you're tempted to just give up and to, to, to just let it all go. But no, look around. God has a way of escape. God is faithful. God is faithful. So take to heart these examples. Um, it's not a this is not a message to scare us, but a message to encourage us to look for God in the situ in these situations. Look for God in these situations. God is right there. God has not left us. His presence is with us through His Holy Spirit. I just want to end this morning as well with an invitation. If there's anybody here this morning um, that has not uh, met Jesus Christ, that does not yet know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And and they're hearing me talk about temptation, talking about sin, and you say, but my, that's what my whole life is characterized by, and I haven't even yet found out how I can be freed from sin. Jesus Christ is the one who frees us from sin. Jesus Christ is the one that's the same way the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, and God brought them out. God is the only one that can bring us out of a life of sin and bring us uh, into the place that he desires us to be. So turn to Christ. Look to Jesus. Um, trust in his sacrifice on the cross. Trust in what he did for you. And he will clean your heart and he'll give you the ability um, to be able to live for him. Let's uh, end with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you because you are a faithful God. Um, Lord, time and time and time again. Lord, even when we are not faithful, even when we don't, Lord, uh, do things what we should or think things what we should, Lord, or, or act the way we should, Lord, yet you are faithful in just time after time after time. Again, Lord, you prove it. Us. And Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters that are here this morning. Uh, Father, I ask uh, that they would just taste and see that you are good, Lord, and that you are faithful. Um, Lord, I pray for this uh, church, Lord, this congregation, People's Church of Two Mountains, Lord, um, that they can just be blessed, Lord, as they continue uh, in, your, in your path, Lord, as they continue to um, just Lord, follow in the, in the way that you set before them. Lord, that they can be a light for this community. Um, Lord, that many people can be drawn to you through the example, Lord, of, 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 of men and women, Lord, that are faithfully following you, Lord. Um, and just that you could show yourself mighty, uh, Lord, uh, in the future, Lord, time and time again. We thank you for what uh, for what you will do. And we give you all the praise and glory, Father, in Jesus' name.